Hi there and welcome to another episode of Health with Dr. Yvette Masaka. This is a podcast that aims to correct myths around health. Today we'll be talking about a sensitive and crucial topic. We'll be talking about living with HIV and surviving TB. HIV is a virus that is called the human immunodeficiency virus. And this is a virus that attacks your immune system. Specifically, it goes for the CD4 cells. And that's why when, when you hear about HIV, you usually hear about the CD4 count. That's because it attacks the CD4 cells. And it causes a syndrome called AIDS, which we now moved away from. AIDS is Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. But now it's called advanced HIV disease. So we're moving away from AIDS and there was so much discrimination when it came to AIDS. Anyway, so I'm joined by uh, Kasoma Chenge. She is an HIV and TB advocate. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So tell me, um, what made you become an HIV and TB advocate? So when I was hospitalized, that was 2022, Mm -hmm. I was being treated for TB the second time. Um, I counseled someone while I was in hospital Mm -hmm. and seeing how much that helped them, just having someone to talk to, someone who can relate, it motivated me to reach, like I can reach more people. Yes, Mm -hmm. that's where the... The motivation came yes. from. When did you find out about your status? When I was 11 years old. And what were the circumstances around you finding out? Uh, I had been a sickler when I was a child. Mm-hmm. I lost my parents at a very young age. Mm-hmm. So I remember when I was eight years old, my auntie took me to the clinic and they started me on septrin. I didn't know what it was about. But I remember in school when we're learning about HIV and they would mention all the symptoms and in my head I'd be like, oh, I experienced that, I experienced that. Mm -hmm. So when I was 11 years old, it was time to put me on ARVs and they, that's when they told me that I was HIV positive. How did you take the news? I think I was quite young and I I hadn't really understood like society and how brutal it can be towards people who are positive. Mm-hmm. So I was okay. You're okay. Mm-hmm. With they did explain to you that you'd be taking the medications yes. lifelong. Yes. And you were okay. I was okay. Did anything change after that? Did you ever go into a period where you went into denial? No. Uh, nothing like that happened Mm -hmm. but in 2016 I was depressed not about the status just about life and itself so I decided to stop taking my ARVs I remember I got them put them in a plastic and the day that the garbage collectors were coming I just threw it directly in the garbage truck and it had nothing to do with okay what do you think made you depressed then if you say it had nothing to do with the um, I think I would say I wasn't feeling loved enough at home. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I decided I just wanted to die. I was like, oh, let me just die. And what happened after that? How long did you not take the medication? Three years. Three years. Yes. And in those three years, what did you learn about? I was fine in those three years. I was completely fine, not even a cough. But when it hit, mm, it really hit bad. So in 2019, I started experience, it started out as stomach pains, you know, gases, gases. Mm-hmm. We moved up from that. Uh, it was headaches that were just not going away. So I decided I wanted to go to the clinic. At this point, I had told my sister that I had stopped taking. So I didn't know that they had already talked about it and said, no, we're not even taking the clinic. We're just going straight to UTH. Mm-hmm. So we went to UTH and they they told me that it was meningitis. So I was hospitalized. After like three days, I lost conscious. And then when I regained conscious, I was hallucinating. And I, I, I couldn't walk. 
like at this point my lower limbs were just affected completely mm-hmm. so um i remember i was discharged and the only thing the doctor said was we don't know if she'll ever be able to walk again but just be taking her for physio yeah how so. did that make you feel i i i i it was It was really something that was uncomfortable. You know, you go from I was 21, so you go from being an adult who can do everything by yourself to some to a point where you can't do anything. It was literally lifting you from the bed to the bathroom and back to the bed. Did you ever at this point regret stop stopping the ARVs? Very much very much and i i remember i just said i'm never going to do that again fast forward a few months later uh the stomach problems came back mm-hmm. went to the clinic they did an x-ray and they found that my intestines were twisted so they did an emergency operation and it was fine like came out and it was okay but then a bed so And the thing with this bed so is it it I don't know if I can say it was hidden because I was bedridden so when I was in the clinic they were not mm-hmm. bathing me they were just wiping me. So the day I was discharged and we go home and I take a bath and it's like the skin just peeled off and it was a big so on my back. And now we had to discontinue the physio and now focus on this big so plus an operation and this bed so took so long to heal when we thought it was starting to heal we started digging in oh no yeah uh at this point i mm-hmm. couldn't even say i wanted to die because i was just like you tried to die and it didn't happen and here we are so i just i just decided to take everything in and So was this the same time that you were diagnosed with the TB? The first time, yes. That was in 2016? 2019. 2019. Yes. So you had um you had TB. Yes. And you had meningitis. Yes. So the TB caused the meningitis. Yes. And you took the medication. How how did how did that make you feel um so i i've had a f- quite a number of patients um who are always complaining about the pill burden so they say they struggle taking their arvs and also taking the tb medication mm-hmm. because they say the number of pills is just too much well i don't like i don't like pills i really don't and people find that surprising when i say it because if you give me pills if you give me 10 i'll just put them all of them in my mouth that's me i think sometimes it's just it's a mindset thing you know i just tell yourself to say i hate pills but then in the situation where you have to take them i think it's better to just adjust your mindset and say okay this mm-hmm. is the situation so i just have to deal with it So how do you think living with HIV has has shaped your your life? Um uh, how has it influenced how you look at life now? Well. Um I I I think and truly believe that we people are very ignorant because when you look at the amount of information that is readily at our disposal about HIV mm-hmm. stigma should not still be a thing mm-hmm. but yet we have people who still stigmatize people who are positive people who are still not educated on matters relating to HIV mm-hmm. And yet we have social media, we have smartphones, you can just google these things. So I feel like as a people we are very ignorant. And also Zambians we don't like to read. Oh no no, we have a very bad reading culture. Too much. <laughs> we don't like to read. But has has being positive ever affected your relationships? 
I recently had a lady who was diagnosed with HIV. Now, her major concern, or not major, one of the concerns she had was that, look, I'm a single woman, Mm -hmm. and now this is going to really affect my dating life because every time I... I want to date someone. I'll have to explain to them that this is the situation. So has it ever affected your relationships? I know there's someone probably out there who's listening and wondering if they should open up to, you know, potential partners to say that they're they're positive. It's very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and you never really know where to start from and you don't know if it's the right time. Some will say no, tell them in the beginning. Others will say no, wait until they're in love with you. <clears throat> but, and most people will say no, disclose it in person. Mm-hmm. I personally have never done a disclose in person. I mean, I just text it. I don't even want to see your, like, I don't <laughs> want to see your reaction. Like, mm-hmm. react where you are. Um, opening up is... So at the hospital, they teach us the the how, the when, and the why. Mm-hmm. So you have to understand why you want to open up and is it the right time and the where, where, where the location of where you're going to tell this person about your status because there are certain people who can even get aggressive with you when you tell them, especially if you've had unprotected sex with them before. So for the person listening who is wondering to disclose or not to disclose, <laughs> listen, <laughs> honestly, if you're not ready to disclose, just don't don't have unprotected sex with them. At, at least that way, they won't have anything to use against you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if you're not ready to disclose, just don't have unprotected sex with them. And if you are going to disclose, you have to be mentally prepared for a possible rejection. rejection. Yeah. yeah. Well, and um, with, I know there's so much information, and as you said, people are really ignorant. Um, because some people still think that you can get HIV from a casual touch, from a handshake, from a hug. So I would imagine that if if that person, your potential partner, mm-hmm. doesn't have enough information, they can actually think that the one time they hugged you or the time that they greeted you, that yeah. you may have They'll actually... They'll probably be running to the clinic. Yeah, running to the clinic, so scared, thinking that... You infected them. You infected them. Now imagine a situation where they actually, they didn't know that they were infected. And they find out that they are, they'll probably still accuse you. Yeah. They'll they'll still accuse you. Yeah, because people are, um, are really unaware of their status. Like even, even in this day and age, I mean, we're still getting people who are coming in very sick very sick like can even wonder like where have you been this mm-hmm. whole time and you test them for hiv and actually find that they are positive. they're positive but from from the way they present you can actually tell that this is not a recent mm-hmm. infection and you can actually tell that the person has been home for a very long time and it's because also people like doing rounds in the community you go to witch doctors and things like that. Mm-hmm. And also um, self-prescribing of medication. Yes. You get a headache. Instead of going to the clinic or hospital, you just buy some Rufed or, mm-hmm. or some Bristan or something, and you take the headache goes away. Not knowing that the reason why you have that headache, maybe there's a more serious condition connected to it. So mm-hmm. we like self-prescribing medication, at home and also Doctor Neighbor. <laughs> Dogs, I like that. Doctor Neighbor is very mm-hmm. dangerous. Yeah, because they will tell you something which is not true, mm-hmm. but you will run with it. Mm. People, I don't know why people are scared to go for VCT, although they are scared because they are not 
ready to face the reality if they do find that they are positive mm. they th- people always think about taking pills every day but you know i personally believe it's actually easier to live with hiv than to live with some of these other conditions that's true because we have people who have to do shots on themselves every day and mm-hmm. so many other things but living with hiv is so much easier because and now it's even more easier because it's just one pill yes one pill once mm-hmm. a day and that's it and as long as you take that pill religiously you are okay you're healthy you're fine mm-hmm. so i i think the 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 reason people are not getting tested is because of the stigma the stigma and the what's the word the thingy <laughs> around <laughs> around hiv uh, stigma discrimination the dis- that's not the word i'm looking for but okay. yes the discrimination <laughs> around hiv so now they are scared what if i'm hiv and then people you'll find people people, think? people i know a lady who stays in zingalume and she collects her arvs from kamwala why I, because if i go nearby people will see me so we still have these situations where people feel the need to hide because they do not want to face that stigma and that is the reason why people are not getting tested and that is the reason why people are stopping ARVs it's just the stigma so if you really look at it it's just a mental health issue and that's what we need to focus on really mm-hmm. you know i had a patient on the ward so she was she was born with hiv but she stopped taking her medication. She, she was, I think, around early 20s. So she stopped taking her medication and she developed TB. Mm-hmm. Now, I was explaining to her. So I was like, no, because of your condition, you have uh, developed uh, you have developed TB. So now, I don't know if, if I was being loud. I don't know. But she was like, shh. Like, yeah, she literally told me that. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, uh, but it's just a conversation between you and me. I wasn't even, I wasn't loud. Even the time I wanted to check what um, ART regimen she was on mm-hmm. because um, people are on different ARTs. Yeah. yeah. So I was getting the bottle from from the bag. So I was trying to like lift it and see. She was like, Mosa, chow some bag. I'm like, hey. <laughs> okay. And I assume she was behaving like that because of the stigma around it. Yeah. She was being very careful. She didn't want anyone to touch her file, anyone who's not a health personnel. She was like, don't leave my file on the bed. I don't want anyone. Some of these relatives are really pokey. I really don't want them to start reading in through the file. So... I guess it's because of the the stigma. Mm-hmm. I remember once at home, um, there was a lady who came from the village to work for us, and we didn't know that she was positive. And when her medication was done, she went to ask a neighbor Uh-oh. which clinic she can go to. So this neighbor comes to tell us, do you know the person you're keeping is like this? And we sit down and we're like, why didn't you say, and how long have you stayed without taking your medication? She's like, ah, two weeks now (laughs) and you know i encounter people who who will be like ah i have not taken my ARVs in two weeks and i just be like look at my life Mm -hmm. that alone should motivate you to take your ARVs maybe for for (coughs) those who who don't know what you mean what do you mean by look at my life so basically from like 2019 <clears throat> Up until now, I'm still dealing with the consequences of stopping my medication. Mm-hmm. 2021, I had recovered. I was walking again. 2022, it hit again. TB again. And <clears throat> until I was in that situation, I didn't know that TB affects. I just knew about lung TB. Yeah. 
I didn't know that there was spine, brain. I didn't know about yes. all this. So when they, the first time they told me I had TB in 2016, I was like, but I'm not coughing. Yes, and that that's very common. Yeah. Like, I'm not coughing. So then they're like, no, it's not lung. And the treatment for the spinal one and the brain one is one year, not six months. Yes. So it's I did double. the first one year in 2019. And then in 2022, again, I did another one year. Hmm. yeah that's that's really something so for two years you've taken tb medication yes and for the last five years i have just my life has just been based on just trying to survive you know just try it sometimes i will look at my friends they are progressing they're doing this they're doing that and i remember my therapist said to me to say because i don't beat yourself about it it's not that you haven't been doing anything. You have been trying to survive. That's doing something. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's in such moments that I, I feel motivated to talk about my journey and to just counsel people on the dangers of stopping their medication because I don't want someone else to go through what I'm going through, you know? Because I believe sometimes we go through things so that others should not go through them. That's true. Yeah. So that. So you're always encouraging people not to. Not to stop. But I must say, um, you are really brave. Thank you. Because personally, I don't know if I can do what you're doing. Um, I'll probably be one of those. I mean, I'm a health personnel, but I'll probably be one of those who doesn't come out and is just yeah. in the closet and yeah it's it's really it's really encouraging that there are people like you because in as much as people will not admit it we do need people like you because in the hospital we really know what what this um non-compliance mm -hmm. can really do because we have people dying and I think this day and age, people shouldn't be dying from having HIV. Yeah. It's just unacceptable. I remember one of my, one of my lecturers was also sort of an HIV advocate, um, was saying that just like you have black, you have white people, mm -hmm. different races, you also have, um, HIV negative and HIV positive people. So just... Just take it that way. Don't look at them any different. Mm -hmm. They're also human. And they're just different, but they're still human. Mm -hmm. I actually think it's unfair that we have to be identified by a virus that is in our blood. Mm -hmm. Since when it has become our entire identity. Yeah. Um, A doctor once told me to say, HIV doesn't kill. He said... So HIV is like a house, okay? Mm -hmm. In a house, when you're going to sleep or when you're leaving the house, you lock the doors and the windows. So the ARVs are the locked doors and windows. So when you don't take the ARVs, you leave the doors and the windows open. And when you leave doors open, what happens? Thieves break in. Thieves are the TB, the mm -hmm. meningitis, yes. Because you don't make it hard for them if you're not taking your medication. Yes, it's very the easy. door is open. Yeah. Because <laughs> they just the door is open for them to just come in and get whatever they want. Yeah, if they and want to get your trust brain. me, mm -hmm. they will. Mm. Yeah, because even um, cancer mm -hmm. can come in because of not taking your medication. Things like Kaposi's sarcoma, which is a cancer of the the blood vessel, mm -hmm. those things will come in if you're not taking your medication in fact like when you start when you just find out that you're you have kaposis and you haven't been taking your medication one of the first things they do actually is just start you on the medication and some people actually improve and that's something that people don't know every time they think about hiv people just think about tb mm -hmm. and they start thinking about um things like meningitis, but it comes with a whole lot of problems. 
And one of the misconceptions that I actually don't like is that anyone who has TB has has HIV because TB can affect anyone. I mean, it's just easier when you're not taking your ARVs, but anyone can actually get it because we're in Zambia, which is where we have TB everywhere. It's really endemic and you have um, people coming to ask, oh, how did I get TB? Like you can get it anywhere, you can get it on a bus, you can get it in a classroom you can get it if you meet someone for the first time and yeah. they they know or they don't know that they have TB. It's just it's just there everywhere. Yeah. It is, but I also feel like there's there isn't enough information mm-hmm. about TB. That's also true. Yeah. Did mm-hmm. you get any discrimination over the TB? Not from friends and family, mm-hmm. no. I don't know about the outside world, but from like the inside where I was, I was pretty. I have very supportive friends. Yeah, I think that that helps. That also helps because mm. if your inner circle is not very supportive, it's even hard to adhere to medication. And another thing is people will be like, I adhere to my medication correctly, but I'm not gaining weight. I'm just losing weight. And that's where the mind thing comes in. So I'm always telling them, so you have not accepted it. Yes, you're taking your medication every day, but you have not accepted your status. And you can be taking the medication. The weight will just be going. You'll just be looking sick. Yet you take your medication correctly. Because mm-hmm. it's a- it's a mind thing yeah, it's also. a mind thing. You have to accept it and have peace. Come to terms with it and just. So, do you feel that HIV was um, talked about more then? Because I remember, like, we used to have rulers and books and whatnot and poems. <laughs> we had that come magazine for Sheris Makovale. Yes, remember. yes. And there was this this guy, um, was he a biker or something? Mm-hmm. I remember because yeah, I had a little crush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you feel uh, like when talking about HIV less now? Yes and no. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have just moved away from how we used to talk about it then. Mm-hmm. Then we would mostly talk about abstinence. But now we are mostly just talking about PrEP. So you find that you hear people say things like, I'm more scared of getting pregnant than of being HIV positive. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I remember in that same magazine, um, I think on the first page, there was ABC. Mm -hmm. A for abstinence, B for be faithful, and C for for condoms and now i hear people have even moved away from abstinence and the use of condoms yes because people are now people have become comfortable it's like Mm -hmm. i just got the clinic and i'll get prep just got the clinic and i'll get prep you know for one of the health workers um he went to get prep no, in fact, it was PEP. PEP, yeah. Yeah, post-exposure prophylaxis. Actually, before we go any further, uh, there's a difference between PrEP and PEP. So PEP is post-exposure prophylaxis. That's after you've been exposed to uh, HIV. But PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. That is in anticipation that you'll be exposed to it. Especially for people who have partners who are positive yes yes so for them um i think we were giving them the normal orals Mm -hmm. for they take them for 28 days Mm -hmm. but now at least we now have um, this injectable yes so now back to my story there's a healthcare worker he went to to get a pep Pep. so he goes he goes like ah you know he's telling me and the nurse says ah you know canido prick and 
the nurse was like, mm, doc, just say the truth. <laughs> like, just say it, mnaluvyanya. Don't accuse the needle prick. And it was just, <laughs> it was just funny anyway. So they're always saying that healthcare workers are always accusing the needle the pricks, needle. <laughs> but <laughs> in actual sense, they're doing other things. <laughs> so I, I feel like people, people have started relying on, on prep, prep too on much. Prep, yes. And I don't know if we should inform them that PEP is actually ARVs. Yeah. So that you know that while you're discriminating us who are positive and you're <laughs> going to get that PEP, you and us, Chimochine. The same. Not the same. No yeah. difference. It's just the name. One is on treatment. One is on prophylaxis. But Thank you. But they are the same drug. Yeah. <laughs> I think we, people should know that because yeah. they think it's different things. I think it's just pep. It's just yeah. pep. No, it's pep. heavy. <laughs> do, you, do you feel like we have enough uh, counseling when you you go for reviews? No. So what 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 happens when you go for a review? They'll ask you, um, have you missed any dose in the last since your last appointment? If you say no, okay. If you say yes, they'll ask you why you missed it. And then maybe they'll just say, Okay, eh, don't forget to drink your medication. Like there isn't there isn't really any counseling for me. That's what I would say. That it's just eh, if you stop taking your medication, you will die. So when someone wants to die, what do they do? They stop, they stop taking, taking their medication. And then when we come now, you are, you, are, you, you are the people who then shout at us to say, we're making you, you work harder. Why are we stopping? You told us we would die. And we wanted to die. die. And people take it literally like you just stop, you then just, you die. That's all. But it's, it's a slow death. Yeah. And you hear nurses and doctors complaining to say, yeah. These people who stop, I think they really just make our work very difficult. But is are you are you are you educating them enough about the dangers of stopping? Because I don't think anyone would willingly stop their art knowing the consequences that come with it. You know, I just I don't I just don't believe anyone would do that. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that we we don't know. We, do, we want to die. So when we want to die, we stop. So you feel like the healthcare system is also failing? It is. And you know why? They don't want to involve us, the people who are positive. Mm-hmm. They, will call, <clears throat> they will call, they will have the whole year doing everything. And then when it's World AIDS Day, they will call someone who's HIV positive and they're like, oh, we would like you to say a few words. The whole year, you've been doing so many things. You did not involve us. And then on World AIDS Day, that's the only time. December. <laughs> that's the only time you want to involve us. So I think that also is a problem. Because if you put counselors who are positive and who are passionate, they will be able to educate people enough. They'll be able to counsel people mm-hmm. the right way. But if you just put in just anyone, anyone they just be like, okay, you don't see, okay, take your medication. If you don't, you will die. Yeah. And that's why I actually felt that this this discussion was very important because, I mean, I'll, I'll say that. I'll say if you don't take your medication, you know, you're going to do this, this, that, and eventually die. But it it won't carry the same weight as it will when you're saying it. Because you know it, you're living with it, and I think you you are in a better place to actually talk about HIV. I may know the science behind it and whatnot, but I'm not I'm not living with it, so I don't I don't have that experience. You know, theory and practical are very different. Yeah. I can tell you, I can come and tell you about the side effects. I'm saying, oh no, you're going to have insomnia, uh, you're going to get diarrhea and whatnot, but that may not be true for you. Mm-hmm. And it may not be true for other people living with HIV. So it carries more weight when it comes from someone like you. If you say it does this, that, I can't argue. Yeah. I really can't. So I'm very, very happy that you came to talk about this. And 
Wish. You're really brave. <laughs> and it's... also with the counseling, mm-hmm. I don't know if the local clinics, but because may I collect from UTH, so at first I was collecting from the pediatric center. Mm-hmm. And there, that's why they ask you some, have you missed your dosage? But at the adult center, honestly, zero. Nothing. There is nothing at the adult center. Mm-hmm. You go, you do your weight, they'll write your weight, they'll write your height. That's it. Go to the doctor's office or go to the bleeding room, go and co- collect your ARVs. That's all. So that, that, even in theory, that is not enough. It's not. But do you, do you ever think that maybe the healthcare system sometimes gets overwhelmed yes they do they do get overwhelmed and that's where we as advocates and activists come in Mm -hmm. because they can only do so much also there are people and the workload so now it's our part and that's the only reason why i'm saying involve us you know involve us in these things involve us in the workshops not just on first December, involve us throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Like we really, we really want to be involved. We want to do, the, I mean, uh, we have a WhatsApp group for female um, HIV advocates. And you know, we're just saying the other day, we're saying, we want to do more. We would like to do more, but we just don't know how we can do more. But we would like to do more, you know. For me, I always say it goes beyond social media because the we have people like the elderly especially we have people in rural areas who are not on social media yet they are positive they are taking their ARVs who in those areas is educating them and telling them the dangers of stopping their ARVs the importance of adherence who is no and they don't have access to this information mm-hmm. and we would la- as much as we would like to do more Resources and opportunities are not They're limited. Yes. Mm-hmm. But but this this is a start. <laughs> it it is a start. <laughs> yeah, and I just um I just hope that we'll have a lot of people watching this. I mean this is not only for people living with HIV, but if you know someone, also this is also for you. If you're taking care of someone this is also for you to also encourage you. And just as we've said, you can't get it from um, a casual hug. Um, I mean, there's some there's some instances where you've heard of needle pricks, but yeah. that's also the risk is, is quite low. Um, so most of it is transmitted through sex. And as, as she's just put it, uh, protection is very important. And also knowing your status. Mm -hmm. Knowing your status is very important because sometimes people come to the hospital when it's, when it's too late for them. And it's, it's very sad. I really don't think people should be, should be dying because of, 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 of HIV. Yeah. And with the, the way technology has, Mm -hmm come in and the doctors now are more educated on the matter and even the drugs are less yes oh and they're, they're actually bringing in now injectables yes we're excited for the i'm excited for those yes i i am excited for for that too uh but i mean now it's only prep mm-hmm. which is um injectable yeah which is injectable for now because um when you're on art mm-hmm. it's a combination usually but the injectable that they've brought in is just one single drug, which is not enough. But I think as a country, it's, it's a step forward. Yeah. Yeah. Even if I had a partner who's positive, at least I'll know it's just, you know, an injection every two months other than. But you'll find that we're still going to have difficulties with that. We're still going to have people who will not be adhering to their injections. Yeah, well, it's it's it is what it is. Yeah, it's the world we live in. Yeah, but also th- the other danger from a science point of view 
is that when you stop your ARVs, there's actually a chance that you may develop resistance. I know mm-hmm. we're always talking about antibiotic resistance, but even ARVs, you can develop resistance. And now people are taking one pill, mm-hmm. but if you develop resistance, we may need to put you on even more pills because we need to find something that actually works for you. I'm taking three. Oh, you are taking three? Yes. I'm taking TLD and DVR. Oh, that's uh, Darunava, yes. Ritonava. Okay. So, like in your case, now you're taking three. But, I mean, it can be more if you develop some resistance. Yeah, it can. And mm-hmm. you know what happened to me when I was um, sick in 2022? Mm-hmm. The the viral load was good and detectable, but the CD4 count was at 108. 108, and I remember I went to the doctors advised me to say I should go back to the center. So I went to the pediatric center of excellence, and the lady at the reception tells me it's normal for someone who's being treated for TB. There's nothing we can do. Just go home. By the time you're done with your treatment. It will just, it will start going up. So, you know, it did sound correct to me. I still insisted that I should see a doctor. And she says, okay, let me find out if there's any doctor available. And then she comes back and says, no. The doctor uh, is going to call and talk to you. A few minutes later, hey, the doctor has called. She's also said the same thing. So, luckily, I have a brother-in-law who works at the center. So, he says, no, just go to the adult center and see a professor. And I get to the adult center and I'm surrounded by doctors. Mm-hmm. Because they are, they are going through my file from the beginning. They want to know the problem. So I always, when I think about that incident, I always tell myself, if I had gone home, I would have died. It would have just been one of those cases where Umundo mm-hmm. Abonafi. Because my CD4 was very low, 108. Yeah. But you know, we've had people with a CD4 of 1. Ha. Yeah, 1 or 2. How do you even... <laughs> Eish. Yeah, they are there. Mm. Yeah, so um, we're moving away from using the term AIDS. Mm-hmm. Now, what we're using is uh, advanced HIV disease. Okay. Yeah, so for someone to qualify as advanced HIV disease, you need to have uh, a CD4 less than 200. Mm-hmm. Then uh, any child below five is actually considered advanced so we we give you particular attention Mm -hmm. like if you're less than five years then if you are really sick like to a point where you you can't walk maybe your you know your vitals are also deranged Mm -hmm. so we also consider you as Advanced. advanced yeah so you know um world health organization has actually staged hiv like Stage one, there's one, two, three, and four. But uh, I won't get into that. But when you're in stage three and stage four, then you're considered as you're considered as, as advanced. advanced. Yeah. Yeah. Because there was so much discrimination around uh, AIDS. Mm-hmm. So even from us uh, healthcare workers, you know, you can imagine you're on the ward and. You know, you say someone has has AIDS. It wasn't just sitting well. And you know how UTH is sometimes? Uh, you say something like that. You then see other people, you know, checking no, to see like, hey, who is, who's this who's this, who has AIDS in this, in this world? And so uh, we avoid using using that. So HIV leads to to Advanced. AIDS, but everyone just calls anyone with HIV to say, hey, Alina AIDS, Alina AIDS, which is actually not correct. Not everyone who has HIV has moved on to, to AIDS. That was just a side note. <laughs> <laughs> because this this uh, episode isn't meant to get into, you know, the science of it. We're here to encourage people to take their medication and just live life. Yeah, just take your medication and live life and don't 
confine yourself to the <clears throat> to the idea of society it's just a virus in your blood it does not define who you are as a person you are you and then you have hiv but you are not like i'm not like people will say kasoma the positive girl no i'm kasoma and then they i'm positive but then i'm a whole person mm -hmm. before you put the virus to it mm -hmm. and i think i think I, i i think it's time we really just start treating hiv like any other pandemic mm -hmm. like covid yeah i mean there were covid positive people and there were those why, negative people yeah we didn't discriminate anyone so why can't why can't we change the narrative around hiv yes in the 90s it was terrible it was killing people mm -hmm. it was what but we are not in the 90s yeah, anymore yeah so many advancements we are now. actually in an era where there is so much advancement there is so much prevention and people are living healthy mm -hmm. lives healthy lives when you are dear to your arvs you live a healthy life is there any incident or a story you've heard that was um that was really you know like discriminating and you you know like it really got to you so the patient that i cancelled while i was in hospital mm -hmm. he tells me that um he was a student in a boarding house and he decided to tell his housemates oh. about his status that was brave mm -hmm. and they went to the landlord and said you should chase that one he is positive Damn. you can imagine you decide to share with people that you are found with you know just to find comfort and so that you can drink your medicine freely and that's the reaction that you get so uh, what did he do did he went and him? threw away his ARVs he threw them away and he got really sick he's partially blind now oh yeah stopping your ARVs can make you go blind mm. That's a very very sad story because if if those uh housemates of his had information mm -hmm. they would have probably you know taken it better and he wouldn't have had to go partially blind but also sometimes i feel like if you don't have information it's better not to react or to comment mm -hmm. until you get more yeah. information like it won't hurt you to just say you know nothing and just keep quiet and not react you know nothing you don't know what's happening yes i actually feel, I feel it's feel sad bad. you know because his whole life was turned upside down because of this one incident he went from adhering to his medication living a normal life he was studying radiology i don't think he can do it now he's partially no, blind because because you need you actually need to see for yeah. you to do radiology. That, so, that's a very sad story. Yeah, so So th were these housemates also uh, like studying to be health care workers? I think so. That that even makes it worse. And if it was big people, we would say no, maybe they're not exposed. But these are young people with smartphones, with social media like that level of ignorance is just it shouldn't be acceptable mm. we can't it be shouldn't. we can't be the year is 2024 we can't still be discriminating people for being hiv positive because why <laughs> no we cannot why like what's the point It's not like if I touch you you become positive. It's not like if I you associate with me you will become positive. Mm. So you find that stigma is really affecting people's lives. It's just turning their whole lives upside down because you experience stigma and you just you lose it. I know another advocate who is legally blind. She stopped taking ARVs for three months. Three months only. You know, she's legally blind. 
Those those are very sad stories. I mean, if people had correct information, those are things that could have been prevented. I mean, that's that's a life changing event right there. From being able to see to being blind. Yeah. I can't even imagine. It's it's very uncomfortable because now you don't know if you want to live or you want to die. Mm-hmm. Because your whole life now, you have to adjust everything. Everything. I'm still dealing with neuropathic pain. So I'm still taking a lot of pills. A lot. I'm on like the highest dosage for pregabalin. I'm taking 300 mm-hmm. in the morning and 300 in the evening. And you're still awake. <laughs> anyway, I, I would be personally dozing. <laughs> at this point, it has... You're just used to the it now, The system right? is now yeah. used. Because it, it it gives you that, you know, makes you feel that But fatigue. when I sleep, uh-huh. I die. Yeah. When I sleep, I'm dead. I would imagine that because just pregabalin on its own will make you feel a bit woozy, a bit drowsy. I'm actually surprised. So you took pregabalin this morning? Yes. And you're this awake. Nice. <laughs> you see? This is what I'm saying. Like, I'll be there telling people, oh, pregabalin will be making you feel, mm-hmm. you know, sleepy. And here you are. I, I, But no, I feel like it's now, because I've taken it for such a long time, the system is just now used. I remember when I first started it and I was in hospital, I remember the doctors would be doing rounds and I would be dead. Mm-hmm. Sleeping. And they're just like, wake up and I'm like, oh, he's even, there's one waking up. <laughs> I used to sleep so much in the hospital mm-hmm. and, the, and the doctor would be like, all I see you is sleeping and eating. I'm like, yeah, I'm very hungry and very sleepy. Mm-hmm. So it does. I'm taking uh, a lot of medication that should not even be taken for such a long period of time. So all this is because of stopping my medication. I'm still dealing with the consequences. So don't do it. <laughs> in in short, don't do it. Don't be like me. I always stop. Don't be like me. Be smart. Mm-hmm. If you're going to be like me, be like the me that I am now. A baby girl who adheres to her medication. Mm-hmm. I did my labs uh, a few months ago and the doctor says, wow, these results are so good. I wish I could steal them. And I was like, yeah, I like that. <laughs> I like that because I went from a CD4 of 108 mm-hmm. to a CD4 of 445. 445? Yes. That is a normal CD4. Yeah. That is like... I think there are some negative people there who even have less. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's really good. So I was like, yeah. And I also, um, the thing that I have noticed, I think the time that you choose to take your ARVs really matters. I remember when I used to take in the morning, I really hated it. And sometimes I'll just wake up and say, I don't want to take. But when I change to evening, I don't have a problem. It's because I hated taking water early in the morning. But when I change to evening, I don't have a problem. I don't miss my dosage. So sometimes when I cancel people, they're like, oh, I'm struggling. I just ask them, Cha- do you, maybe if you change the time mm-hmm. that you take them, maybe that would help. And it usually does. Yeah, you see, I would, as a doctor, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't know where to start from. I didn't, yeah. I didn't really think, you know, time would affect. No, it does. There are people who would prefer to take them in the morning and then they mm-hmm. put protect them in the evening. So you just have to find what works for you. Yes. And once you find what works for you, find that it's not so uncomfortable. Just put them in your mouth and put some water. Do you still have moments where you forget to take your medication? No, not anymore. But you used to? A long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A long time. It's been a few years now and I, I don't... So it's now become part of the routine. Yes. Do you feel like something is missing when you haven't taken your medication? I don't even... I will put it... And okay, I'm taking it at 22. So here, I'll put it here. And the moment is 22, it will already be near me. And I'll just take it. 
so I do not forget anymore. It's now like it's wired mm-hmm. in my head to say I have to drink. So like do you do you sometimes do it unknowingly? Or do you always have to remember? No, I think annoyingly also. Cuz it's just it's, just, it's a part of you. Yeah, it's it's my life. And when I tell people I don't like taking pills, they'll be like, you like medication? I'll be like, no, I don't like medication. But I have to take it in mm-hmm. order to survive. So there's nothing. I just have to. Yeah, invest. because when they hear you're adherent to all those pills, obviously you think, hmm, you don't mind taking them. I d- when I did the TB treatment the second time, I kid you not, I did not miss a day. I did not miss a day. For a whole year. For a whole year. Said I'm going. Said I'm going to take this medicine religiously. I don't want these problems to come back again. And we hope they never come back. And we hope the people listening don't have those Do, problems. Yeah, don't do it. It's very, it's very complicated. Just t- you, you are fine now. You're taking your one pill. You are, you are fine. You are very fine with your one pill. You're doing great. The moment you stop. It's three, four, and other medications. B six, C, go back off and she. Ah, I don't feel. I feel like some full of chasing. The T B, the T B ones. It's you start with four. Yeah. And then you reduce to two. Yeah. So put four, and then put three ARVs, and then put to B six. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, just just find the time that works for you. And stick to it, and please just take take your ARVs. You will not die if you don't take them. <laughs> you will get sick terribly. Yeah, hmm. Because people really, people really get sick. You know, in in the hospital. Um, I know this would probably sound not not good, but. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a patient who stopped taking a medication for some years and I went to the bed and I was like, where's the patient? And she just flipped up her blanket and she's like, I'm here. She had lost so much weight. I thought there was no patient on the bed. And that's how, that's how sick people can get. And I felt, I felt so bad, but I honestly didn't know that she was there. Mm. And I just hope she didn't, she didn't take offense in that. But she, she's doing much better now. You know, because you know the problem, it doesn't eat you at once. It starts eating you up slowly, slowly. So by the time it's manifesting the effect, so many things would have gone wrong in your body yeah so many things and it and it can hit you anywhere ah mm-hmm. so when you will know at cancer 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 it, it can be anywhere ah. now i was like hey tb spine as in the spine tb yeah. how because it, it can affect the bones of the spine the lymph can, nodes everything and i was like huh you know you can even have like an infection of the eye from tb you can have uh, an infect an infection of your genitals mm-hmm. from TB. You know, all those, just TB itself. Just TB, and it's and it will hit you. TB will hit you. It's just it's just looking around, waiting. Mm-hmm. It's like the devil just waiting to see who to devour. <laughs> just looking for a moment of weakness to just attack. So just, just adhere to your medication, please. We are me. Yeah, I'm begging you, on behalf of. Healthcare mm-hmm. people, I'm begging you on their behalf, please adhere to your medication. You are complicating their lives. Uh, your own life, Mo. <laughs> you're yeah, but, complicating our, but okay, your own yeah, life, but, Mo. Yeah, your own, your own life, life, Mo, because they will treat you, they will let you go home, and then when you go home, find that you can't even, you know, you find that you can't walk. You know, I would sit in that bedroom and I would count the four walls every day. The same four 
was and when they say no i want to go and sit outside yeah maybe someone will be available they'll come they'll carry you because it's a lot of work mm -hmm. also to carry you from one area to another mm -hmm. and people got to just always be carrying you know people get tired yeah so sometimes you just you just sit in the room you just sit i remember i'll just sit in the room because you don't want to bother people. you don't want yeah i don't want to bother people too much and you know there's the the pelvic muscles are also affected so you're just in diapers and adult diapers are expensive yeah yeah quite yeah so don't do it don't do it just adhere to your medication because i can imagine from doing your own things to now being unable to even go to the toilet nothing at all you can't do anything it's it it was hard it was hard i remember um the only people who were able to carry me from the bed to the bathroom was the maid and a male cousin so for all that long period this guy basically had to see me naked and there was nothing i could do there was nothing i could do i needed the help hmm. did you get depressed or was this the same time you got depressed no or this was now after you you got sick did you get depressed mm, no or at this point did you just have a strong will to live at this point i had a strong will to live but lately i get depressed lately i'm just tired i'm tired of dealing with all this complications i'm tired of having to go to there you know it's, it, and it's very inconveniencing because i literally have to go to uth every month to get a prescription and then go to the pharmacy to collect drugs and if i don't have them i am in so much pain i can't sleep i am in so much pain sometimes cold water helps and sometimes it doesn't you know, I have not been able to bath hot water since 2022. I can't. Me and hot, me and anything hot, we don't associate. I don't even associate with the sun. If it's too much, I will start feeling pain. That's how bad it is. If I'm cooking and I stand near the stove for too long, I will start feeling pain. pain. So I have to move a bit and then come back, move a bit and then come back. So dealing with all this, sometimes it's just... It's a lot. It's a lot. So lately I do get depressed, but it's not severe. It's not severe. I always just tell myself, you know, you know, you, 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 you got this. It's okay. It's okay. Do you think that um, one of the things that we should offer when reviewing patients is... Um, like a, a therapist mm -hmm. a mental health check would be very important because you know how when you go for visity and then they cancel you that cancelling i i also feel it's not enough but yeah they cancel you and then you start your arvs and there's never really any cancelling that follows like there's never really knowing how someone is doing mentally because they can come to the hospital, they pick up their ARVs. I remember a doctor once told me to say she had a patient who would come on time for appointments, pick up her ARVs, go home. Every day she would remove a pill and throw it because she knew that when coming back to the hospital, she needs to come back with a bottle and they'll count the pills. She would come back with the bottle and they would count the pills and it would be correct until she got sick. Until she got very sick. Why are you sick? I never used to take my medication. I just used to throw them. So it's because mentally we are not doing the check. You're not asking them, how are you doing mentally? How are you feeling? How are you feeling lately? Do you have anyone to talk to? Do you have friends who know about your status? And also friends. When your friend tells you they are positive, this is not the time to now discontinue the friendship. You will not get HIV from being someone's friend. Mm -hmm. you won't 
I have very supportive friends and even when I told them I wanted to come out only my best friend was like no don't do that I was like you know what my other friends my other close friends were like no go for it go for it and I did and eventually my best friend just came down and was like okay well I think it's a good thing so uh, I think that 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 is helpful it is very because helpful because I feel like if if your friends um stayed away from you mm-hmm. i think it would have affected you even more yes i i believe um our inner circle our family and friends really also play a role because if the discrimination starts from there mm-hmm. you start thinking to yourself what more the people outside if these people Can who know me who are close to me can treat me like this what are the people outside you know what mm-hmm. let me just not take these things let me just die Yeah. I've heard of stories where in some houses um they have their own plates and their own cups, own cups, their own spoons. And I believe well, we should address those people. Yeah. Because you may I I mean it sounds funny but these are things that are happening. Mm-hmm. You they they put their own um the things in their own drawer, mm-hmm. their own plates and when they're done eating they don't put their plates with everyone else's plates yeah wow so people go through that wow mm-hmm. they yeah. do and people who are living with someone who is hiv a relative a daughter a brother a mother a father you will not get hiv from being kind to these people you will not get hiv from treating them nicely and addressing them and dealing with them like anyone else you won't get hiv mm-hmm. the least you can do is just be kind you know be kind be nice to people and that that will help them It will. Yeah. It will also help them with accepting their um, status faster because they will say, "Oh, but if others, if people have accepted me like this, why should mm-hmm. I not accept myself?" But you make it harder when you don't accept them because now they're like, "But if no one wants to accept me, why should I accept myself like this?" Mm-hmm. It's better I just die. It's better I just die. Yeah. Mm. But thank you so much for joining us for this important discussion and. What are your last words to our viewers today? Adhere to your ARVs. Good adherence is equal to a healthy life. Um for those who still stigmatize and discriminate just the same way you're watching this, you can find the time to Google and just educate yourself and see that There is no need to behave the way you behave. <laughs> There is no need to behave the way you behave. Mm-hmm. And for those who have already stopped and they just can't find the the will, the willingness to start again, please reach out to me. Mm-hmm. And we will definitely find a way to um get you back to taking your medication so i have a facebook it's kasoma chenge i have a tiktok it's also kasoma chenge and i have a twitter but we we'll, we'll put it down we'll put, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll put it down uh-huh. but yeah you can reach me on any of those platforms and let's see how we can help each other i want to help you live a healthy life mm-hmm. thank yeah. you thank you so much So my last words will be to just remind you that in Zambia alone we have over a million people living with HIV and really adherence is the key um if you don't adhere to to your medication there are so many so many infections you know even cancers start coming in so um I know that well I can imagine that it's not 
the easiest thing to accept um i mean taking medication lifelong but you know we have a lot of conditions we have diabetes um where you know people have to inject themselves multiple times during the day and that's also lifelong we have things like hypertension all those uh lifelong conditions and to those who have friends uh, loved ones who are living with hiv please remember that you cannot get it from a casual hug from sharing a spoon sharing a plate um they need our support they need our love uh for them to continue taking their medication um it's not always on them and i hope our healthcare system will also be able to do more for people living with hiv in terms of having um mental checkups as as she said earlier on i think those will be important and yeah so this was health with dr ivet masaka um don't forget to subscribe and yeah have a lovely day <laughs> bye